Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Ideas podcast, and you are in for a treat today. I'm so excited about this particular episode. It's the kind you're going to want to share with so many of your friends, maybe if you have teenage kids, college students, people who are aspiring to make an impact in the world. And and certainly that's a message we hear all around us. And I know, especially when we look to the millennial generation and now Gen Z, there's almost a pressure to try to make an impact in the world. But how do we as people of faith... How do we as Christians thoughtfully approach what cultural change looks like? This is the question. This has been the primary question that we've been asking around our world for the last 18 years, which is what does it mean to be faithful in this cultural moment? And what does it mean to be a part of exacting cultural change? And how much control do we even have over that anyway? God's the one that ultimately moves things, and we play a role in that. And we don't want to underestimate the role that we have to play in that, but we also don't want to overestimate it. And I think the conversation you're about to hear between Andy Crouch and Sho Baraka, which was delivered at a summit that we created called the Next Gen Summit. This is an amazing thing. I I remember Rebecca and I just standing in the back with tears in our eyes as we watched these 200 young leaders ages 16 to 30 years old grapple with these concepts that we knew over the last two decades we had learned slowly, we had been made aware of, we were growing in these things. And to be able to hear Andy Crouch and show talk to this group directly at those young ages and to give them this wisdom and this sage advice and counsel early in their life, uh, many of them on, you know, whether it's YouTube or TikTok or Instagram type influencers or athletes or entrepreneurs and business leaders, or, or those who are, are beginning new things in the media space or video gaming or technology, for them to hear at this early age, the way culture change happens and how much character matters. And so as we venture into this space, I hope you enjoy it. I know you will. But I want you to share it. I want this to be the kind of thing that we all listen to with our kids. I have my son, who's 19, listen to this conversation specifically. And then we had a great conversation about it. He's a musician. He's an artist. And some of what you'll hear in this conversation is directly spoken to those who are creators in the world. And so Andy Crouch, of course, is perfect to talk about that. He wrote the book, Culture Making. Uh, He also wrote the book, TechWise Family, Playing God. He has a new book coming out soon called The Life We're Looking For. You'll hear more about that at our Culture Summit, April 28th and 29th. Uh, And then in addition, we had Sho Baraka there as well in this conversation, who's a hip-hop artist and author, and his most recent book, He Saw That It Was Good, uh, is a wonderful read. He also co-founded the And Campaign. You've heard him, Justin Gibney, several of the guys have been a part of that. But this conversation specifically, I think, will encourage you as we think well about what does it mean to have cultural influence. Let's listen now. So, y'all may not know this, but in <laughs> to me, Andy, you're kind of like what I would consider we may call like the OG in <laughs> culture making. Um, I once used that word actually. With uh, I would use it with someone, and they thought it meant like old geezer, and it doesn't mean that. It means original gangster. Like you are the 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 guy that has really pioneered a lot of at least in my thinking and a lot of people's thinking around culture making. But not everyone here um, knows kind of what that uh, language. Like it's I just want the them to have like being the OG. They forget. Yeah. Well, I want them to have like language around culture making. Uh, language around like what does it look like? What does it not look like? Okay. If you can just share kind of some of what does culture making look like for us. It, again, half of this room is not in vocational ministry. And no. a, lit, a lot of the people that are in vocational ministry still have something that they're doing outside of the church. And so okay. just for them to get an idea of uh, how can they be intentional in culture making? What are some do's and don'ts when going <laughs> into culture? Okay. So maybe just start with a very simple, powerful, deep definition of what culture Great. is. What are we talking about when we say culture? Um, we can use that word a lot of different ways, but I think here's the maybe the most comprehensive and simple way to use that word. What human beings make of the world. Culture is what human beings make of the world. And so 
This is a very broad definition in a way. This is not when you talk about the culture as if it's something out there, that we can use that language. And I think we sort of have a sense of what we mean when we say it. But most culture is in here. It's part of the human activity of making something of the world. And that phrase, which I got from a journalist named Ken Myers, I didn't make it up, but I thought it was so good that I just keep using it, uh, also implies something important, which is there's two senses. It's what human beings make of the world in both senses. If I say, what do you make of that? I can mean, what sense are you making? But when you make something, it's material, right? It's stuff. And culture is both sense and stuff, <laughs> both meaning and material. And in fact, the way that we make sense of the world is to make actual material things in the world that express our sense of the way the world could be. So someone came along and said, this uh, camp, which has lots of different forms of architecture in it, needs a place that will create a certain kind of gathering, right? So an architect came along and many other experts of various kinds said, what if we built the room in this way? And some designer decided, well, what if, what if we do the lights this way, right? Well, that makes a kind of sense of this space that tells us as we walk in who we are in relation to the space, who we are in relation to one another, what kind of experience we can expect to have here. And there are other places in this camp that, that I'm guessing, there's probably some like shack-like place <laughs> where the you know se seventh graders do their thing. Their cabins. And the cabins where you're staying, <laughs> and, right? That makes a different yeah. sense, right? This, this, you, this vibe is extremely different this, from the vibe of the other exactly, side. Exactly, <laughs> right? So don't you see how, how did you feel when you walked into your cabin? Uh, I don't know what happened. They put me in the JW Marriott. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm like, this is nice. 22nd floor. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't be telling you this. Uh, that, was, I, that was good culture. I there. did not ask for it either. I would happily stay in a cabin. But even on these grounds, right, you walk into your cabin, you feel one set of things. You walk in here, you feel another set of things. No one told you what to feel or think. The thing itself spoke to you. Amen. Amen. Because the really interesting thing is the only way human beings make sense is by making stuff. <laughs> and in fact, all the stuff we make aspires to make sense. We Amen. never want, we never willingly make things that are meaningless. Amen. And we never make meaning without making things. So culture is this iterative process by which human beings collectively try to come to terms with who are we in the world. This means you can't get outside of it. You can't talk about the church and it when you're talking about it this way, mm. because the church is part of a story playing itself out through history, and by the way, playing itself out in many different places through many different heritages and cultural traditions, each of which is a living story of human beings passing on some stuff they made that tried to make sense, and the next generation is like, well, some of that makes sense, but what about this question? Or about, what about this possibility of the world, this thing we could make now that we couldn't make before? How are we going to fit that into the story? It's this living tradition story of making something of the world. Um, Okay, how long no, do you want me good. to go? No, that's good, I that's good. Wind well, me up and okay, I, you, I want you to set up the, even the idea of the copying culture and yeah. that, just that idea just yeah. briefly. But yeah, just break down yeah, the I different approaches. So there's two things I think that human beings are meant to do in the world and that, that largely, well, the human beings are doing all the time and that Christians were known for doing for a long time. And I would call it cultivating and creating. Cultivating is keeping what's good in this heritage we've received good, keeping something good good. It's passing on what you already got. No, we don't have to come in and say, let's redo this building, but somebody has to maintain it, somebody has to keep it, somebody has to do little updates to it over time. And that's not creativity in the sense of starting from nothing. That's actually starting with what you've been given. Culture is what you've been given by the people who, who brought you into the world, the culture that brought you into the world. So cultivating is keeping, and then creating is, is the, the adding, right? About 100 years ago, through a series of historical circumstances that aren't worth describing in great length here, a bunch of Christians in the United States, uh, largely today we'd call them white, largely we'd call them initially fundamentalist, found themselves in exile from the institutions that their grandparents had built, 
institutions that were complicated inheritances, both good and bad, but they found themselves excluded from all, all the major cultural institutions that their own grandparents had built. And this set in motion the fundamentalist movement, which retreated from the culture-making activity that was the natural thing that Christians had done um, in all places and times where they'd been placed. And it set in motion this series of four things, condemning culture, <laughs> which is where you just, you look at what other people are doing because they've, they've now got the power. The so-called modernist Christians at this time had the power. The, the fundamentalist Christians were ejected from power. They look at what the modernist Christians were do, are doing, what new immigrant arrivals in the U.S. are doing, what the new secular wave of culture is doing, and they say, I, we don't want any part of that. We don't make movies. We don't even go to the movies. Like, we just stay away from it. That's condemning culture. Their children, after the Second World War, get very frustrated with this. It, it, it's sort of a bummer to all you do is complain, right? <laughs> and that you could, it's a bit of a caricature, but maybe not totally. And they said, no, 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 what we need to do is critique culture. We need to analyze it. We need to engage it. We need to like pay attention to it. Almost like missionaries going into a, another land. Then the next thing that happened is we got, the, their kids got good at copying culture. Yeah. We started to see interesting things happening in culture, like, I don't know, boy bands came along. and. <laughs> About 10 years into the boy band revolution, some Christians were like, hey, we could have a Jesus-loving boy band, and we're going to take the cultural form but infuse it with a Christian message, right? And now I think mostly we don't condemn, we don't critique, and, and we don't just copy. Basically, we just consume. So condemning, critiquing, copying, consuming. That's the four-generation story of the dominant mainstream story in American Christianity. Now, alongside this, things are happening in the black church. Things are happening in the immigrant church that are a very different set of stories. But this is unfortunately the dominant story that shapes the horizons of possibility for a lot of us. And the interesting thing is none of these things change culture because they are all reactive. When you just condemn culture, it doesn't change because you condemn it. Have we not learned that? Just saying stop doesn't get people to stop. When you just analyze culture, it doesn't change culture. Just being able to say, oh, well, I see the presuppositions going on there. I can do an intellectual analysis. I can de develop a theory. It doesn't actually change it. When you just copy it, you're always behind the edge of what's actually, yeah. what the actual meaning making is. Yeah. You're just coming along with your imitation. Yeah. And of course it doesn't change when you consume it. All that happens when you consume it is just get reinforced. The only way you change culture is to make more of it, to cultivate and create. And unfortunately, we have four, a four-generation legacy within a certain dominant stream of Christianity that forgot how to do that. So the work of this generation in a multicultural way, retrieving the traditions of our parents, grandparents, and so forth, but retrieving them in a creative way is to cultivate and create. Amen. 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 I think why this is so important, you know, even us bringing those young speakers, I mean, those are, that's all Gen Z, they're all 25 and under, is, uh, you know, I think our generation saw, millennials got to see our parents kind of make church comfortable or seeker sensitive, where it's like, how do we get culture, like attract culture? Um, it made it church kind of comfortable though. And so we were like, we want to cause, we want to go and change the world. We want to go and do this. Sometimes we were more slacktivist than activists. Like we were just doing it on our computer. We never like went anywhere. Um, but we wanted to go do something. But the one downside of the shadow, because I think taking the church outside the walls, uh, out of the church is good. Uh, but the downside of the shadow is I think millennial generation, I see this in Gen Z a lot. I get convicted by not all, but there's this the revival of like revivalist almost in the next generation that convicts me where I'm like, man, our generation kind of tried to be too cool to be like culture, but you can't mm. change culture when you're trying to be like them. Uh, and we're trying to, mm. I'm seeing this thing where it's like, what if we were consecrated, uh, which is the original plan, like consecrate ourselves to Christ and see what he produces as an overflow out of us. Um, and so for you, Sho, I mean, you mm. have to live in this tension <laughs> where uh, in the church and even out of the church, there's a lot of copying what's trending, what's working. Mm. I mean, you're, mm. and it's changing every, I don't even know how fast it changes now in the music world, yeah. especially um, to even the way you dress. I mean, skinny jeans are out, I guess. So now even <laughs> we're done. Like, really? so how, do you this... live, how do you live in that tension? What do you say? So I'm up here out of, outdated, is what I mean. Hey, me, 
It's my, fine. Um, my wife told me two weeks ago, I didn't even realize this. She's like, Grant, you know I don't have skinny jeans anymore. I was like, no, I didn't. And she said, yeah, it's, you just can't wear them anymore. I was like, I can't. still am going to wear a song. <laughs> Not, you do you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> bro, you. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> my we question for you. It, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. My question for you is how do you live in that tension? How do you mm. fight the temptation to copy? I mean, how mm. do you stay fresh? How do you create something mm. new? Because um, I, I feel like you're wrestling in that too. <laughs> um, so there's so many different things. There's, there's, there's a litany of things that I can talk about. I think one is this, uh, and I think especially for individuals like you guys who are influencers who have great platforms, I think there's a tendency to always feel like you have to be relevant. Um, and yes. this chase for relevance actually kind of just kills inspiration. It kills creativity. Yes, yes. Um, yes. yes. And yes. you never take a break. Um, there's a great analogy Lauren Hill once gave about this idea of ascending the mountain and uh, mastership and living. Like oftentimes, uh, uh, culture wants you, our industries want you to continue to climb the mountain in order to master and stay on top. Like hip hop artists always talk about being on top, being on top. Huh. Yeah. But you, you don't live at the apex. Nothing grows at the apex. Things happen in the valley. This is why most of your artists have second, uh, second albums are terrible because yes, what they do is right. they spend their first yes. <laughs> part of their lives writing their first album and then their tax bracket changes, their lives change, and then they're trying to maintain the fame and they're so concerned with fame, they're so concerned with relevance that they never take a time to, to break and to rest. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book, uh, 100 Years of Solitude, there's a, there's a time, so the city of Macondo is a fictional city and they're struck with a, a plague of insomnia. And everybody in the city thinks this is a wonderful thing, right? <laughs> they're like, whoa, we, we don't sleep, which means we can work more, we can do more. But the, 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 what he mentions is after months of them not sleeping, he says they forgot how to dream. Wow. And I think oftentimes what happens is you, you, you kind of you fall, you fall back on the, the five C's that he communicated yeah. when you don't dream, right? Yes. You don't right. think about how can I reimagine right. what God has given me, the raw resources of what God has given me so that I can create. And when you don't have the time to dream, you say, well, I'll just copy well, I'll just, exact, whatever the other C's are. Exact. And so, um, yeah, that's just, a, that's just oh, one that's of true. many different things. This is why the rest is so important in the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we are to Sabbath, is because you make terrible art when all you do is make art constantly without thinking oh. and processing. And uh, yeah, you know. So my question's kind of for you. And I, I think that this has been hard because of, like you said, the relevant thing, right, with music. Huh. And my question is, what is the balance between creating things that are relevant, but also creating things that you feel like God wants you to create in culture? Because you have to stay relevant in some Facts. sense with music, right? Or people won't buy it most of the time. But if you feel like God is calling you to a certain thing in culture. Amen. So I, I would <laughs> say, I love for, not to shame your language, because I think it's perfect. I, I would say rather than saying God wants you to be relevant, I, I just think you just need to make great music because the great stuff you make is gonna keep you relevant. I, yeah. I just think about my favorite artists. One is like Kendrick Lamar. What does Kendrick do? Kendrick makes an album, blows the world away, and he just goes to the moon for like three years. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody forgets Kendrick. Nobody's, nobody's, actually we're like, where are you? Come out and do something. But he's like, no, I don't. I, I need to. I need to. I need to live in a valley. Come out and create. Briefly, because I know he's gonna say something dope. I'll say this. Um, oftentimes, hopefully, this is this. This feels relevant to. You. Oftentimes, we think about we 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 position ourselves with what is what do I think is best? And when we think about what God is calling us to. Um, that's the need. Oftentimes, what we see is God pointing people to needs, not necessarily what they want to do. And I, I know that's a hard thing to swallow. Very again, few times in the scriptures have people had the luxury of saying, no, 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 God, I want to do this. Oftentimes, it's the opposite. They're like, I don't feel qualified. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I didn't ask you if you was qualified. Go ahead and get this job done. And they're like, absolutely. You see that with Moses. You see that all through the scriptures. So I would say just don't... 
don't view relevance as having to always have a microphone and, and shout things. Yeah. I would say see relevance as I'm just going to put my head down, make some wonderful art, yes. put it out to the world, and I'm going to rest. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to trust God that he, that he, got, he has my back. And amen. even if your platform is small, like, amen to that. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen, amen to, the, to the little responsibility he's given you. I'm relevance. I I don't think that I don't think we want that to be one of our indices. I think relevant is only relevant for people who are in a hurry. Ooh, come on. One more time. <laughs> Relevant. I just thought of this. I don't know if it's any good at all. I mean, what? Yeah. But I think, I think relevant is only relevant for people who are in a hurry. Yes, yes, yes. I think the great challenge of the definition of pop is it's commercial. When you are participating in that industry, you are surrounded by people who are in a hurry to make money from you. Money is in a hurry. Come on. Art is not in a hurry. Wow. Cu <laughs> cu cultural influence, in cultural influence, reshaping how people see the world, what they imagine is possible, that you cannot hurry that. The more in a hurry you are, the more relevant you are going to feel pressured to be. The more people whose paycheck is down the line from your productivity, the more you're part of a machine that, that tells you you're relevant, but you're actually becoming less influential. So I just, you've got to have a different thing. You could probably hear in the room the eruption of people cheering and hearing some of this wisdom. And you might have been feeling it yourself, especially when Andy talked about relevance, not being in a hurry, and how we have to think well about trying to be relevant versus creating things that take more time. And I, I appreciated that. It was a word of wisdom to all of us, and especially to younger generations that feel that cultural pressure to produce right now, to be relevant, to be cool, to fit in to be uh, affirmed in the moment versus understanding this long road, this long journey of how God works over time. Well, if you enjoyed this, you can actually watch this entire conversation. We have a two-hour version of the Next Gen Summit where we had over 10 presenters. They all came together here in Nashville. We had great conversations around eight different topics that we wanted to explore with younger leaders. And so we've put that into a two-hour mashup where you can watch some of the best moments from those two hours. Just go to qideas.org slash trial. You can get free 30 days access to Q Media. You can watch this and so many other talks. You can watch this full talk by Andy and show and listen to the conversation, the Q&A. Just awesome. Such a great experience for all of us I think also I want to remind you about April 28th and 29th, the Culture Summit. I mean, we are weeks away now, and it is shaping up to be the best we've done. And I feel like every year we think that, we say that. And part of it's because every year is so shaped around what are the questions facing us as Christians today, as leaders, as those who care deeply for what it means to cultivate the love of Jesus, the truth of the gospel, the truth of how our world was meant to function, how we as human beings are meant to flourish. Like we get into all of that. The theme this year is called Signs of Life. And we're we're going to be pointing out all the ways and and the the opportunities that we're finding in this world right now for life to go forward, for truth to go forward in beautiful ways. So you're going to be inspired. You're going to be encouraged. I know you'll be challenged. You always are. I always am by the conversations, but you can learn more about that at qideas.org slash 2022. And this year's the first year you can actually virtually host. You can bring a group together at your church, your business, your home, and you can actually experience it not alone, but with others. And for those of you who might be traveling or you just want on-demand access, you can get a virtual pass as well. And we're excited to just all as a community all over the globe explore these questions and these conversations together and continue this learning journey. So I hope you have a wonderful week. Share this episode with those you love, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.